Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we're talking rare earths, critical components in modern technologies, and also critical in energy transition, particularly in electric vehicles, as well as in wind turbines. We're talking what are rare earths, what is the market structure, what is the opportunity both now and in the future for the commodities sector. Our guest is Chris Goodman. Chris is on the board of Canada Rare Earth. Chris has had a 20-year career trading hard commodities and has spent the last five focused on the rare earths markets. Chris, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me on, Paul. So I'm looking forward to this. So we're going to dig into what rare earth elements actually are and and the market structure around them and some of the future trends that you see. Before we dig into, I guess, the chemistry, they have been in the news a lot just in the last couple of months, you know, the the first quarter of, of 2021. What's going on? I think, Paul, so if we maybe go back a little bit and look at where they've been in the media over the last decade, um, there's been sort of two strong periods uh, where they've been in global media. The first one was back in 2010, 2011, purely because of a a China-Japan trade spat. A Chinese trawler was detained. There was a, by the Japanese, the Chinese reacted by closing down the exports of rare earths to Japan and prices spiked tenfold and there was a a bull market for for a number of years and that led to some other sort of bits and pieces which we'll talk about later there then things really to be honest went pretty quiet and then during 2020 um there was a president xi and president trump were having as you know the us china trade war and as part of the wider trade dispute there was an introduction really of this of rare earth and how China dominates the rare earth industry. And President Xi uh, publicized a visit to a rare earth refinery back in May 2020. And, you know, I think this was to remind everybody that, that China is the dominant party in, in, in the rare earth sector. Yeah. And that, that I think has played into a lot of what's in the in the zeitgeist at the moment about a, a commodity super cycle and that being in part driven by the need to, well, energy transition and a lot of these new technologies require a lot of these rare earths which we're going to come on to but also this need to in the wake of a global trade war and in the wake of covid where these highly efficient supply chains broke down in many cases the need to start being i think uh, securing national interests around natural resources by getting them from more friendly locations somewhat of a reversion back to the cold war in some sense but that's all ahead of us what are rare earth okay so to, yeah to start off with you know a, a description of, of what they are you, there are 17 elements which are regarded as as rare earths and within the periodic table that's the lanthanides which is 15 elements plus you normally get scandium and yttrium uh, added in because they have similar properties and you know they've been called rare earth since the 18th century but it, it's not uh, a reference to the abundance in the Earth's crust. I mean, in terms of their abundance, there is, um, uh, you know, they're found in the same levels as, say, chrome or nickel. Um, what the, the rare refi- uh, refers to really is how difficult they are to get out of their ore body and also that they're not normally found in, in great enough volumes to, to be economic in, in terms of extraction. Um, They're normally, so when you talk about rare earths, they're normally split into lights and heavies, and that's just done simply by atomic number. And um, in their metal form, they have unusual fluorescent, conductive, and magnetic properties, which are important for today's uses. Um, The four that are really on everybody's tongues are neodymium and presodymium, which are lights, and they're... um, referred to as ND for neodymium and PR for presidymium, NDPR. And on the heavies, it's dysprosium and terbium, DY and TB. They're really at the heart of this uh, energy transition and the decarbonization of mobility and uh, energy. And they go into the permanent magnet motors of electric vehicles and they go into the the turbines and in, in wind turbines. So they're the ones that really get talked about. Staying on kind of the industrial uses and a bit of the history, these things have been around, as you say, for quite some time and, you know, have been, in, I guess, of growing importance to the modern economy initially, actually, I think, in the um, arms manufacturing. 
But can you just keep us on sort of the, the history and the uses of these rare earths? Yeah, sure, sure, Paul. I mean, I think it's it's really important and it's interesting to to get a perspective of what they've been used for. And, uh, you know, it's changed dramatically over, over time. So there was a German scientist back in the late 19th century, a guy called Welsbach, and he basis the, the the incandescent properties of rare earths he developed a, what, I mean, it's a gas lamp or it, he invented a mantle which is basically a gauze soaked in metal salts and when you it's quite difficult to light but when you light it it gives off emits a, a white light uh, for a long period of time and interestingly by the middle of the 1930s you'd had over five billion mantles uh, produced and you know producing these mantles actually there was a lot of rare earth flammable waste uh, that was produced as well and Wellsback alloyed this waste to iron and it created what's called mish metal if you heard about that this flint stone which went into you know cigarette lighters ignition devices etc so you know that was the early period of, of rare earth uses and then you know things have, have sort of accelerated from there in the 1950s um, color TV technology required europium, one of the rare earths. In the 1960s, they had a, um, uh, was research funded by the US military. They had a samarium cobalt magnet. Um, 70s and the 80s, there was a lot of research in batteries and, and you still have this lanthanum and neodymium added uh, into a nickel, it's a nickel metal hydride battery. Uh, the 1980s, there was aluminium scandium alloy that was lighter and stronger. A lot of this research was funded by the Russian military. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things that um, it's probably it's a lower value product, but cerium is used extensively as a glass polisher and a cracking agent, a petroleum cracking agent. And most of the volumes actually coming into the US these days are, are from a volume perspective is cerium. I think one of the most interesting sort of uh, uses and, and you know how it came about is during the the 80s i think it was 1982 general general motors and sumitomo they combined neodymium iron and boron and created uh, you know an extremely powerful and lightweight permanent magnet they also added a little bit of dysprosium and terbium which further enhances the magnet it allows the magnets to operate at, at higher temperatures and really, you know, this for me is, has been crucial. This is why um, they're used in today's gadgets. I mean, it's the miniaturization of magnets. So now they go into, into cell phones, in various parts of cell phones, in various parts of cars, you know, the, the electric window, uh, you know, the windscreen wiper. Um, the, it also goes into computer hard drives. Um, and, you know, you touched on it earlier, but, the, you know, the decarbonization of energy and mobility. So NDPR. DYTB go into the permanent magnet motors, which are in electric vehicles, and also into the to the wind turbines. What are we talking in terms of volumes? And were each of these various actors able to mine locally at that time? Can you sort of give us a bit of context around that? Yeah, I mean, look, if we talk, I mean, let's talk first about the, maybe the volume and the scales that we're talking about. Um, we would always refer to rare earth oxides, which is, is the output from a refinery. It's only 170,000 tons a year of, of globally of rare earth oxide production. It's abbreviated REO. Um, 15 to 20,000 tons of that comes from, is, is produced in Malaysia by a company called Linus. And then the rest is basically China. Um, in terms of the raw material, you're mainly China. Um, Australia has a mine in, uh, sorry, Linus has a mine in Australia called Mount Weld. And there's been the restarting of a mine in California called Mountain Pass, which is now owned by MP Materials. And they plan, they're planning to have a refinery. So not just um, the raw material, but they have REO production. The idea is by, by next year, about, by the end of 2022. If you look at the, you know, what's that worth? What are these things worth? Um, 170,000 tons is probably, you know, somewhere around the range of 6 billion US dollars. And, you know, if you consider that the copper market, today's copper market, you know, the annual size is 300 billion US dollars. So this, you know, this is possibly why, you know, you, you, know, you haven't talked about rare earth or people haven't talked about rare earth in, in, in a great amount beforehand. I think the interesting thing, though, is that um, these materials go into, obviously, uh, a large number of goods and, you know, over a trillion dollars of goods contain rare earth components. If you have a, a, a you know a disruption in the supply chain, that you know obviously has a has a knock on effect. 
Yeah. Before we get into what, re- I guess, the story of China dominance in this, can you just talk a little bit about that, the manufacturing process? What are the ores, the, the refining process, which I understand is really kind of the rate limiting factor here, both technologically speaking, but also from an investment standpoint as well? Yep, for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, there's probably around 200 rare earth minerals around the world, but only three really have any economic potential. And they all come from igneous rock, so from magma, from lava, um, and a specific rock called a carbonatite rock formation. You have three these three um, minerals. One is monazite, one is basnazite, and the other is xenotime. Um, you also have some secondary deposits, which are coming from the weathering of these primary sources. Um, and one of those is really its iron absorption clays, which really has been mostly China. And this is probably gives, you know, has certainly given the industry a bit of a bad name. Uh, this this ionic clay is leached in situ with uh, with acid and um, has been pretty damaging from an environmental perspective. You, you know, you mentioned about the... Um, uh, you know, refining being a bit of a bottleneck. I mean, around the world, there's probably 800 mineable deposits. But the issue has been, you know, how do these things go into production? You obviously need finance. Um, and it's been difficult to get finance. A lot of investors were burnt uh, after the last spike that I mentioned, the um, 2010 um incident with china japan which then led to price spiking you know people got excited got in got burnt um so people are a little bit more wary now about putting money into um into the rare earth sector uh, you know and i think one of the one of the big things is that china has has dominated the industry over the last certainly 20 years they their biggest deposit and you know, the most well-known rare earth deposit in the world is a is a mine called Bayan Obo in China, which is a is actually a, a polymetallic. It's actually an iron ore mine, and rare earth is a byproduct. So in terms of you know costings, um, you know they're they're mining iron ore anyway. So this is kind of a very cheap way for them to get the the rare earth out. Other well-known deposits in the world, you know, maybe Mountain Pass in California, which is a bastnazite and Mount Weld in Australia, this Linus mine, which is also a basnazite. Um, it's also worth noting that there are within mineral sands or so within heavy heavy mineral sands, there's monazite is contained and you know there's um, decent deposits throughout the world, whether it's Africa, Australia, Brazil, USA has some too. Um, it's probably just worth you know mentioning now uh, you know how, production has evolved you know since this you know pre 60s so obviously we talked about wells back in his uh, his gas mantle he was or the the source of the uh, the rare earth that went into all of that was was monazite really from brazil india and uh, and the usa so that's kind of to be honest probably up to the 1960s that was the main source of of uh, rare earth that kind of changed in the 60s um mountain pass in california um, which is the, the bastnazite deposit. It has lower radioactives than uh, compared to monazite. And um, this became sort of the biggest mine in the world, yeah, for the biggest rare earth mine in the world. In the 1980s, China started producing from their large deposit. Um, and, you know, right until really quite recently, they've just completely dominated um, the, the scene. And it's probably, I'd say, probably quite a good time now to talk about, you know, the history of Mountain Pass in, in the USA. I'd love to go on to that. A um, couple of questions. One is, how environmentally destructive is mining and refining rare earth materials or elements? And are we, this is a difficult one to sort of ask, but are we kind of at the peak of efficiency and technology to extract these minerals? Or is there a lot of, you know there's still a lot of opportunity to do it more efficiently and more cleanly. Okay, so yeah, starting on the on the first point about, you know, is it environmentally damaging? I think in China, of course, um, the onus on on keeping things environmentally um, friendly or, 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 you know, well looked after has been less than in other countries. And I mentioned earlier about the extraction of, of rare earths from iron absorption clays. It, it's definitely um, had, a, had a toll on, on the environment, but the Chinese have definitely cleaned up their act over the last 10, 15 years. And, you know, the process, 
there are other similar chemical processes in in the world that uh, are extracting uh, resources from in a, in a similar way which is you know using acid and then solvent extraction so you know applying uh, a modern way uh, industrial processes uh, modern industrial standards it shouldn't be any more or any different to to some other chemical processes and in, in industrial processes in the world so i think you know in short it was potentially environmentally damaging in in the past but uh, these days it's been it's been cleared up and it's a uh, you know it's a lot better than it used to be in terms of, of technology um, you know extraction technology and we can kind of touch on this a little bit later as well and some of the reasons you know why that's changed but this is something obviously the, the process of of taking the rare earth out has not really changed that much over the years um it as i'm reliably told it's not rocket science um but the chinese now have been uh, refining for 40 years and you know they've been learning they've been doing things um or, or changing things around a little bit but you know fundamentally it's the same um i don't you know i don't think there's a massive amount of of technical technological advantage that could be had um versus say different methods and uh, that, that come in what what you're seeing though is that the, because the chinese have have done this now for such a long time they just have a natural advantage of of you know greater money spent on r d um you know there's uh, different processes that uh, within the overall extraction that they've they've honed and are doing things basically on a better on a more cost efficient way so I, I, you know tech definitely plays a part and i think being able to show to people that you've got a industrial scale working process is uh, is extremely important you you know will uh, you, you know you've talked or we talk about smaller companies that are, are maybe um, at the edge of this uh, technology, rare earth salts in, in the USA. Um, uh, there was Medallion signed a deal, uh, I think it was last week, with Purdue University for a new way of separating or, or using Purdue's separation um, process. There'll be people and companies that, that say they have access to new technology, and it'll just be interesting to see how that all develops. I think if you're an investor, you want to know that the whatever process you're backing has been done on an industrial scale. Thanks for that. That's a, a good insight, an overview there. So you've obviously got, this is where we're sort of starting to move into the current market structure. You've got um, this desire to diversify beyond the China um, for these rare earth elements, particularly with the view that these are going to become increasingly in demand and also are already subject to trade wars and you know it's a powerful lever that the Chinese have. You mentioned, can you put that in the context of um, uh, Mountain Pass and Linus and kind of what we're, we're seeing going on there and these incredible valuations as well? Yes, I mean, uh, if we start with the Mountain Pass story, um, so as I mentioned, it's, it's a bastinazite mine in California, and it started in the 1950s. And initially, it was producing europium, which went into color TVs. It, it helps um, in, in the cathode, giving a color, red, the red color. Um, it was also basically, um, you know, filling the, the, the rest of the uh, rare earth global demand. And it was mined and processed at site in California. It was in 2002, the mine was actually closed down. Um, environmental issues were, were definitely there, but I think mainly it was economics. I mean, the Chinese were squeezing prices down. You know, they had uh, all the downstream industries on their doorsteps. Um, it, it was easy for them to kind of squeeze um, squeeze mountain pass out of the, out of the market. Um, so, you know, between that time, 2002, 2010, for eight years, Nothing really happened, and the mine was sold to, to Molycore in 2010, and there was an IPO. And I think the IPO price at the time was around $14 a share. And remember this other thing going on, this geopolitical uh, fight between China and Japan during the same time. It drove the you know tenfold increase in some of the prices. The Molycore shares went to $75 a share, which at, at the time was around a $2 billion market cap. You know. They, so during 2010, they were, they were planning to reopen the mine, which uh, happened in 2012. Meantime, they purchased a couple of processing plants. There was one in Estonia, a company called Silmet, and they also purchased a company called Neo Materials, which had Chinese processing plants. 
And by the time they opened the mine, 2012, this geopolitical spat had finished. Um, there was, you know, Japan was receiving um, supplies again from China, and the prices went down. And by 2015, they'd entered Chapter 11. Um, you know, I think it's important to, to to say as well that back in those days, I mentioned, you know, there was a kind of a progression over history of uh, what the uses of uh, rare earths were, and the Chinese deposits had a better mix of, of some of the higher priced rare earths, which are really the, the heavies. And again, this, you know, it just couldn't compete. Um, Molly Corp and, and the Mountain Pass asset just couldn't compete with the Chinese. So uh, enter chapter 11, um, the downstream processing was high processing, um, which obviously now they had the, the Silmet, the Neo materials, and the and the site in California. This was hived off into Neo materials, which itself listed on the on the TSX ventures, I think, and the mine closed down again. And I think the most interesting part of the story is so last year in July 2020, um, they merged with a SPAC. It was called Fortress Value Acquisition Core on the New York Stock Exchange, which is under the symbol MP. So um, yesterday, MP was at you know, $46 a share. Market value now, I think it's 6.5, 6.7 billion US dollars. It's, it's three times the best previous valuation. You know, the mine is up and running, it's working. Um, what they're doing at the moment is they're exporting a rare earth concentrate to China for processing, because there's really nowhere else for it to be processed. Um, but interestingly, last month, the uh, last 12 months of revenues have been around 100 million. So it's a it's a genuine, uh, you know, competitor to the to the Chinese uh, domination. The other guys that you you know you mentioned Linus. Um, Linus have uh, it's a basnazite asset, basnazite mine in Western Australia called Mount Weld, and this is uh, you know interesting as well. They they mine the ore in Western Australia. It's partially you know, concentrated, beneficiated, and then this is sent to Malaysia, where they have their um, refining plant, where it's processed, um, which seems obviously seems a little bit strange. Um, the Malaysian government has decided that it won't be able to continue refining there, and I think it's by 2023, um, or they've they've had an extension of the license until then. So they're actually building a refinery in Australia. Um, and at some point, probably around by 2025, they won't have the operation anymore in Malaysia, or their primary uh, processing will be in will be back in Australia. I mean, you know, building a plant in Australia, obviously heavy capex. Um, you know, opex will be higher than than other, you know, than certainly China. And I think you have to, you know, you have to have a, a positive look on the market to. Uh, make sure that Linus um, and and MP will be in the same boat that Linus and MP can survive, survive uh, and won't get squeezed again as as has happened previously by the Chinese. And I want to talk about, I guess, the future and consumption expectations. Just before we get there, on the market structure side, so are rare earth elements considered commodities? Are there, where do the commodity traders, if at all, sit within this at the moment? And also, where do the traditional miners, you know, the the, the, the big metals miners, where do they sit um, as well? Is this very much still a niche play, dedicated, um, bespoke, you know, producers? What, what's the, the broader structure there? So, the, I mean, the, the short answer straight away is that the big miners have, have really not got on uh, into this game yet. And, I mean, I think you know, basis a, a six billion annual you know market value of products you know there's a, a reason why and the guys that are, are sitting there with decent valuations at the moment are the guys that have mines and have refining you know refineries so it's kind of an integrated supply chain and you know they're dealing with um you know they're dealing with the customers directly so mp materials will right at the moment is exporting to china because China is is where this material is is processed, and because it's processed in China, the the next um, customer in the chain, which will be the you know the magnet producer, um, they're sitting in China too, majoritively. I mean, there's some in Japan, some in South Korea, but you know the, you've had these um, uh, industries built around. Uh, where the where their materials have been so you know with china's policy on on eking as much value out of uh, um 
you know, within country, within China itself, these guys are the ones um, taking, you know, taking, uh, you know, the downstream industries. And I think that's really where, from a market perspective and, and you know, where the customers are, that's where we're going to have to see change over the next five to 10 years. So, you know, will Linus end up selling material to Australian um, ma magnet producers or, you know, at the moment it sells to China and to Japan. Will MP materials, once it's producing the rare earth oxides, will it start to build a um, sort of a nascent industry in the US around, around this? I mean, I, uh, you know, I don't know. I would expect that's where it will go. Um, but I think that, you know, you have to have government buy and you have to have change and shift in government policies about this for, for that to go through. Mm. What's fascinating about this is that if it becomes increasingly, you know, the demand continues to increase and actually technological innovation means the uses of these things also becomes more strategic to nation states and so forth. Do you see the disintermediation by trading houses, by traders? Uh, before we answer that, is there, how are these things currently priced? So it's, it, I mean, from in my memory, I, I mean, this brings me back to um, trading coal many many years ago before any indices were set up. Um, you know, there's there's a couple of of the journalistic um, pricing, uh, or, or you, you know, we get published on a on a weekly or a daily basis for for, for some people um, the the prices, but that's not a you know, it's not a hard and fast. It's not an OTC. It's just um, getting a, a, a an understanding of what the prices are in the market and you know, that means that things are a little bit more opaque and you know that's normally attractive for for trading firms because it you know allows you to to keep one step ahead um so i think you know right the, right now um on the raw material side with everything going to to china um you know from a trading perspective i mean we i see a big increase in in Chinese queries for material coming into you know they're looking for raw materials that that wasn't there even 12 months ago um, so there's probably you know there's a there's a there's a point at which traders could get into this um, whereas you know as much as 12 18 months ago that that opportunity wasn't really there and and you know Chinese domestic demand so high that they are already importing from overseas as you know the MP material they're doing deals with uh, you know mineral sands guys um, when you've only got so much material, you've got demand increasing, you know, it, that's a good environment to, to, to pick up opportunities. So, uh, you know, uh, there aren't a host of traders in there at the moment, but it's something that I believe, you know, from a market perspective that will develop. I mean, the trader always offers, uh, you know, the, the, the basic, it can help with the finance, it helps manage the um, up and down in the in, in, in production um, you, you know, there's a, there's a role for traders there. There aren't that many rare earth traders out there, though. I think is one of the other 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 challenges. Um, just so so you alluded to it there. What's going on right now? So you mentioned Chinese demand way up. What what's driving that? What are we seeing in the market as we speak today? I mean, we're seeing so rare earth prices um, on the back of the the commodity super cycle and just Chinese demand, um, rare prices have gone up strongly over the last five, six months. And you've seen that on the back of the equities that are exposed to the rare earth sector. Um, and you've seen that in the prices that you know we're seeing for the, for the raw materials. So, I mean, that's being driven by greater demand within China itself. So, uh, you know, more, there'll be more man magnet manufacturing. There's, there's, uh, I think you're seeing across the globe um, and certainly during the COVID uh, lockdown, um, the world is far more conscious about uh, climate change. You know, how do we address the climate change pro problem? I've sat in a, quite a few um, virtual conferences over the last few months that, that have been focused purely on uh, addressing, you know, decarbonization of, of mobility, of energy. These are all you know, rare earths are at the heart of all these uh, these changes. I mean, I've enjoyed you know listening to the the podcast that you've done on on hydrogen, and I think you know from a mobility perspective, there are a few options out there. It's not just electric vehicles that are going to be the the winner uh, overall, but you know, there's you could see 
three times the the demand in in rare earth uh, going into with just wind turbines and permanent magnet motors for electric vehicles over the next ten years. And I think you know China realizes that, and China's starting to um, you know to get ready for those for those increases. And and it's just having you know with along with this cycle, it's having a positive effect on uh, on prices and on and, and on demand. Yeah. Uh, one question I have is kind of like lithium, um, you know, actually it takes longer to build a, a lithium manufacturing plant than it does actually an, an electric vehicle plant. What's the investment cycle? Because, I mean, there's an argument here from what I'm hearing that if you're going to get this huge, almost exponential rise in demand for, you know, for rare earths, could we see, you know, prices just skyrocket and you know because the because the investment cycle is just that much longer what, what, what is the investment cycle in getting one of these mines and integrated refiners up and running i mean I, look it's it's not it's not positive for the industry as a whole if we see a massive price spike because it, it just it, overall it will it's gonna there'll be a, a downside at some point and and people will get burnt and, and, and so i think we all need to be planning now um, and, and, and this has been going on for some time. So, you know, participation in, in mining projects, um, you know, there's a number of projects around the world that I, I mentioned there are probably 800 deposits, but um, four or five of uh, mines are moving, you know, closer towards bankable feasibility studies. Um, obviously, MP Materials is, is starting to produce at, at decent volumes. There's expansion plans for, for Linus. They'll be able to take up some of the of the slack in terms of, of the increase in demand, but you know this the, the cycle from um, you know from finding an asset to to drilling it out and getting the finance it is still you know between five and ten years um, from from inception. So this is something that, you know investors are aware of this, um, mining companies are aware of this. Um, I mean, we still really see the rare earth sector sitting in in the junior miner sector. Um, it, it's not, you know, none of the the big mining companies have, have picked up on uh, on this. Whereas, you know, the, you hear every other day cobalt, lithium. You mentioned um, they're more in the spotlight, but the the demand curve on rare earths is is going to be similar to to cobalt or, or the increase in copper. So it, it's interesting to see, and I think again mentioning that. Um, a lot of people, a lot of investors got burnt back in 2010, 2011. It, it's working out what you need to present to those investors to have a project that, that has legs. And I think one of the, going back to the, you know, the valuations that we see in, in just the equities, your, the projects that are doing well are those that have got an asset and access to technology. And you know, if you can come to market or you have a strategy where you're moving further up the value chain by not just producing a basic concentrate, but you're going as close to a rare earth oxide, that's going to be more attractive. And then working out, you know, do you have a technology partner? Do you use new technology? Um, you know, I think for me, a company that has access to, to a Chinese technology um, you know, designs for refineries, operation, you know, can operate refineries. That for me is something that's very interesting. And, and I, I, I think it's crucial in terms of the financing part of it to, to be able to, to have a decent solution. And I think one of the interesting things I find still is that when you talk to the, the mines out there um, that are really purely focusing on, on developing a, a rare earth concentrate, um, their valuations for, or the, their understanding of what their pricing is going to be, and, and what prices are going to get with the with the refiners, is just extremely optimistic. I mean, I, you're not going to capture 70, 80 percent of the rare earth oxide price uh, under under today's market structure. Um, you know, it's going to be much lower. Um, there's, I, I don't know really any other commodity at the moment where there's such a decent refining margin, and you know that opportunity is not going to be there forever, but I, you know I, I see that as the the miners have to think about that and how they can eke more value out of their uh, uh, out of their business. So really, actually, the the that value add step up is at the refining stage, you know, and and actually the ore is quite discounted. Does that come back to because this is an interesting sort of paradox in a way that 
you, it is a, a relatively environmentally destructive process mining rare earth materials, yet rare earth materials are part of the necessity of energy transition. And you mentioned financing there. I imagine this is presents a bit of a dilemma to the financiers about does this constitute a, an ESG investment or does this constitute, you know, quite a deleterious environmentally um, impactful uh, mining business? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we mentioned with the the Bayan Obo deposit, which is, um, you know, it's primarily an iron ore mine. So if the iron ore mine is in development and you're taking a secondary product, which is rare earth, is that a better way to do things rather than having a specific rare earth mine, which yeah you know, might be. You, I think under today's standards, obviously standards are increasing globally, and and you know ESG is such a, an important part for for financiers that it's going to obviously has to be reflected by the by the miners. But you know there are um, you know monazite that um, again could be a, a byproduct or a waste product of, of other mining uh, activities. That that's possibly a way to look at it. But I you know I think when it gets to ESG and, and mining, it's not just rare earths, it's it's across the board. And that's something that we either have to live with or, or you know, have to address and have to spend time and money to, to make these things less environmentally um, destructive. Um, and, and, you know, lower the lower the overall footprint. Um, or we're not going to have those elements that go into into technology. It's it's I think it's quite a kind of a black and white scenario from that perspective. Mm. And as I understand it, recycling of rare earths is actually quite technologically challenging in and of itself. Yeah, no, I, that's a good point because we haven't mentioned recycling. Um, I, I haven't focused much on on the recycling part of the the sector. There's there's some tech that's out there. Um, I, I think as you know, as more uh, goods are, it, it, for example, it's quite difficult to extract value from the rare earth say from an iphone um you know it's it's a very small amount and you know, it's it's quite a lot to to get it out but maybe when we're talking about uh, uh proliferation of electric vehicles you know wind turbines uh, etc then refining becomes uh, a far easier proposition in in uh, one final sort of thing i just wanted to touch on i did find it fascinating you you so you and i in the preparation for this discussion talked about tesla and the the needs that would go into and i guess this is at the heart of this question about scalability in not only electric vehicles but all of these energy transition technologies as well um in terms of the raw materials that go into them um i found some of the the information you shared there quite fascinating because whilst rare earths aren't the rate limiting or you know certainly uh, consumption will increase, not necessarily as much as, product, uh, as as elements like lithium. But can you just talk a little bit about, just I guess, re-emphasize for us the, the demands are going to be out there from the electric vehicle growth on rare earths? Yeah, I mean, not just, I think that the two big ones that I, I see, the electric vehicles, for sure, and also the um, uh, wind, wind turbines, wind power, um, you know, you have... In the UK, you had Boris announcing uh, the, the government announcing huge. You know, they want to be the uh, the equivalent of Saudi Arabia for oil, as, uh, you know, for for wind power. Um, that's you know, 32 gigawatts of, of power coming online. I mean, that, that the amount of rare earth required, I'm sure, hasn't been. Fa I mean, it, it, it's been discussed, I'm sure, but it, that's a lot of rare earth. Um, if you were to consider Tesla at a, uh, producing 20 million cars a year. Um, and you take 2019 production numbers for, for rare earth, and it's the magnetic rare earth, so the, the four that we talked about, ND, PR, DYTB, you're basically taking up 40% of the global production. And that's only, you know, it's Tesla with 20 million cars. And, you know, obviously just going through the numbers that um, European uh, governments are, are are saying that they don't want any uh, internal combustion engine sales, uh, vehicle sales by 2030, or um, you know, some like Norway's even even sooner than that. I mean, 20 million is going to be a drop in the ocean. It's going to be a, a much higher number. So the impact to the overall demand curve is, is massive. And, and as I say, that's not including the uh, the wind turbine uh, section. So uh, you know, we need to we need to be 
discussing this as a, a you know between investors uh, mining companies and you know experts in in rare earth refining because you know this is going to have a big 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 impact on on demand and and we need to be sure that we're ready on the supply side and it's not easy to substitute um I mean, yeah, yeah, we could put hydrogen vehicles in instead of electric vehicles if it's um, if the numbers are, you know, we're, we're suffering. But it, it's difficult to substitute rare earths out of these uh, these technologies. And it is, you know, we talked about the time required. I mean, you know, say five to ten years for bringing on supply. We need to be making these decisions now. Fascinating. It sounds from all that you're saying that a, it's unfortunate how that a decade ago that sort of false start burnt so many initial investors because you know this might this time round it actually seems like it's um it is there's going to just be sustained demand out there even if evs and wind turbines don't grow as as governments necessarily or, or and, and organizations wish um there's just simply not that supply out there available and it, and it does need to be addressed i agree and I, you know it's it these are the best conditions for investing in the rare earth market where again whether it's equities whether it's you know, uh, trading, whether it's uh, looking purely at, at, at projects, whether it's getting involved in the tech side. Uh, yeah, the demand increase is going to lead to, and in my view, more value available upstream um, because there's going to be more refiners wanting the same cargo and, you know, their margins will reduce and, unless those costs are passed on to, you know, to the end users. So, and as I said, I, I don't see other commodities with such room between the raw material costs and the refined product value. It's just, and that's that arb is not going to be open forever. Um, you know, from a trading perspective, you need access to to the raw material, and and you know you need the relationship with suppliers, refiners. You need access to capital, um, and I think you need to be diversified right across that supply chain, whether it's you know upstream, midstream, downstream, and you know, to really pick up on this. Yeah, which I guess brings us full circle. And the the question there is, there aren't many rare earth experts out there. You yourself came from, you know, other hard commodities and, and came into this, uh, which others can obviously make that transition as well. But it's going to be, a, I think it's going to be a, a challenging space to, but obviously a high, potentially a highly lucrative one. I hope so. I've got my fingers crossed, Paul, that yes, it's, um, this is the right time to be involved in, in the rare earth industry. I think, look, I've been involved for, uh, you know, five, six, seven years now. And um, I definitely see, and I'm, you know, fingers crossed that this is, uh, this is the time to be involved and, and the opportunities will be out there for sure. Fantastic. Well, um, it's been a, a fascinating discussion and, um, you know, a really interesting sector. And, you know, I think it's one of those ones where it would be good to have you back on in a year's time and, and see, you know, where we are there, because I think it's going to be a, a fast moving, fast moving area. For sure. Thanks, Paul. I really enjoyed being on this. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and Human Capital, a search firm dedicated to the commodities sector, go to www.hcinsider.global, where you'll find more original content on the commodities sector and more details on our offering as a search firm and our locations around the world. Thanks again for listening.